we're getting up there in terms of numbers of board members. So I'm going to give them a few more minutes to come in and then we'll start the meeting. Just to note, our elected representatives are in as panelists. Yes. So their numbers will be contributed. Mm -hmm. Remember, if you're not coming in by phone, to please put your video on so we can see you. I guess you can do that by phone too, right, Luke? If you're using um, the video, but if you're just calling in. Then, then you can't, right. right. <clears throat> OK. This is the quietest it's ever been before our board meeting. <laughs> well, you can't just turn to your neighbor and mutter something. Exactly, exactly. But you're my neighbor right now, Dick. Yeah, but if I mutter something... Everybody you know, hears it. <laughs> yeah, I might hear you both from being on the other side of you, Vicki. Right. We're going to wait a little bit longer because I'm going to explain the process and I want to try and get as many people on to that to understand what to do as, as many as possible. What are we up to, Craig? There are only, I think, four board members then. I think that are coming that haven't, been, haven't signed in, four or five. Okay. So, up there. <clears throat> okay, Keith is on. Hi, Keith. Hey, how are you? Okay. Nice to see everybody. Same here. We're just here. gonna wait a couple more minutes, see if we can get everybody in to hear the process before we start. Sounds good. I'll go on mute. Yeah, there are, there are only two uh, board members that we're expecting that haven't signed on yet. And okay. They may not come because of given the holiday. Just yeah, okay. I was hoping we get all the electeds here, so but they'll figure out what to do. So, um, okay, you think we're down about, only about two or three, Craig? Uh, there are only two that, I, that potentially would be coming tonight that aren't okay. yet, and, and they okay. may not be, they might be observing tonight. All right, I know we have a couple of more electeds. I know Gail is coming and Brad and Carlina, I believe. Um, Carlina's here. Oh, and, and Senator Kruger's on. <coughs> Hi, Vicki, yes, I am on. Hi. Okay. Carlina, <clears throat> Carlina's on. What's that? Carlina Rivera's on. Oh, good, okay. All right, I'm going to start. Um, before opening the meeting, as I traditionally do um, over the years, I want to take this opportunity to really thank our board members, all of you electeds and the CB5 community for being part of this really unprecedented virtual board meeting. It, this is almost by any measure the worst crisis our great city has ever faced and the same can no doubt be said of all of us as individuals in our lifetimes. That this meeting and other community board meetings are even taking place, I believe, speaks to our collective determination to do our modest part in maintaining a can-do spirit that New York is famous and known for. So I will leave it to the electeds with us this evening who will be speaking first who may be in a position to address what progress the city is making in dealing with the crisis and any plans they might possibly share with us. 
But now um, I'd like to begin the meeting by explaining the basic format we will be using this evening. So we have, as I said, we have a number of electeds in virtual attendance who will, as usual, be called upon to speak first. And I will ask you to raise your hands and we'll call upon you one at a time. Uh, we also have um, representatives of the electeds who will be permitted to speak for two minutes to raise your hands when I call upon you. Next, those who wish to speak during the public session will be asked to raise their hands. I will call upon individuals in the order in which raised hands are received and then click mute. No, I'm sorry, I skipped a line. And then <laughs> when I call upon you, please unmute and make your statement and then click mute. At this juncture, you will as usual be allowed two minutes to make your statement by way of visually seeing a two minute timer on your screen. If we have a number of requests from the public to speak, as usual, I respectfully request those of you who are here with others to speak about the same issue to take the time element into consideration and please do not repeat something that has previously been brought to the board's attention. It is important to be succinct and to avoid long explanations of your position since the committee and the board have already received detailed information. We are primarily interested in whether you support or are against a particular issue. At the end of the public session, the board will move into its business session. At this time, only board members will participate in opining on agenda items that are presented by committee chairs by way of questions, comments, and finally on the issue before them. For the sake of everyone being able to hear, please remember to keep yourself muted throughout the entire meeting unless called upon. One last important note, at seven o'clock, we're gonna pause the meeting, our mics will be unmuted, and we will all participate in the nightly gratitude applause for our essential workers. I'll start the meeting now by calling on our electeds to raise your hands and I'll call on you one at a time. So we have council member Keith Powers. All right, so I think it's the only time I get to go first, but uh, <laughs> thank you everybody. And it is so nice to see all of you. We don't get to see each other uh, now, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to being back with the board sometime in the future. Thank you for hosting me here tonight. And it's always nice to see where everybody lives and see where uh, you are, are calling in from. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna be too repetitive to many things you've heard. Um, I just wanted to say a few things that I think might be helpful. One is that um, today in, in where I live in Stuyvesant Town, we put together about 700 meals that we packed with City Harvest using volunteers from the neighborhood. Uh, we actually took an old converted supermarket, we packed meals, and we actually went out today and delivered about 700 meals that went to the East Village, the Lower East Side, Kipps Bay, uh, in Stuyvesant Town, and some other areas. And I think we're gonna try as much as we can, as long as we have the resources, to continue to do that. And I've spoken to Speaker Corey Johnson and his office as well, but other places where there might be a need to help get people some food. This is both prepackaged food plus produce. Um, so I would love if you have a, uh, a particular building or area or neighbor that you believe needs some resources right now in terms of food or food delivery um, to send that over to our office so we can try to put them on the list. And if we do get to do more, that we'll be able to try to reach out to them and do our best to get them uh, a meal because we heard from so many people today who aren't leaving the house or are running low on food or maybe don't have the means right now. So we're gonna to continue to try to do outreach into neighborhoods outside of this one to help those in need uh, partnering with City Harvest. So if you wanna be um, helpful to that, please reach out to my office, either Abigail, who's on this call, or you can reach out to our general office and we'll be uh, more than happy to help out. Um, second is we're going to be hosting a forum next Tuesday at six o'clock, which I'm going to send the details out over to everybody for uh, to you. Um, it's going to be with the Small Business Administration, uh, the Federal Small Business Administration's Regional Director and the City's Small Business Commissioner uh, about small business issues um, to both help them as many folks are filling out the forms and trying to figure out how their business can, can access resources. We're going to try to help uh, keep the get 
get resources that they need. It's not going to be big on speaking. It's going to be basically questions and answers directly to business owners to try to help them get access to businesses. Uh, we'll send it over. We'd love everybody to be able to promote that as well and to tell the businesses in CB5 that are looking for help that they can jump on this. It's going to be a web event and they can ask questions and we're going to do as much as we can to be able to get people their um, help that they need and answer any very specific questions they might have as they're trying to get to particular resources. Um, it is going to be ongoing in terms of how we are going to be meeting remotely. Um, the council is also trying to get itself equipped and able to be able to do remote meetings so we can start working on the city budget. Um, but we, while my office is fully operational, if there are neighborhood issues, if there are resource issues, if there are other things that you think you need right now, do not hesitate to reach out. We have people on the phones, emails, everybody's working on different issues and trying to solve for some big issues right now at this moment. So please just use us any way you think we can be most helpful. Flag issues for us that you think aren't being paid attention to. Um, and of course, be safe and be healthy. We are hopefully gonna be turning the curve on this soon, but um, a lot more social distancing. And I will just say I am, um, whenever it is that we are all back together, I am, will be so grateful for it and I'll be so happy to see everybody again. Uh, you don't realize how much you miss people you don't get to see them uh, every month. So um, thank you, everybody, and, and hang in there. I know these are tough times, but I'm really, really um, uh, hopeful that we'll be out of this soon. And um, I'm thankful for all my colleagues. I know some of the state folks are on here for fighting very hard in the state budget this year and for doing really great work with their constituents at this particularly difficult moment. And uh, thank you to CB5 for letting me have a few minutes here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Be well. Next, Assemblyman Richard Gottfried. Well, good evening. Uh, and I just want to congratulate everybody for uh, the effort to get on uh, uh, this uh, Zoom meeting. Uh, we're all learning uh, new ways to communicate. Uh, you know, the main thing I want to talk about, hopefully briefly, uh, is some of the things that were done in this year's uh, state budget that we enacted uh, now just almost a week ago. Uh, you know, as chair of the health committee, most of my work uh, was devoted to uh, trying to stop uh, as much as we could uh, the really horrendous cuts to the Medicaid program uh, that Governor Cuomo was uh, driving to, uh, to implement. Uh, you know, we were able to, um, well, we being uh, me as chair of the health committee in the assembly, Gustavo Rivera from the Bronx, the chair of the Senate health committee, uh, and a lot of advocates around the state were able to stop some of the uh, things that the governor was trying to do. Uh, you know, his main target uh, in Medicaid cuts was long-term care, not just nursing home care, but particularly home health care, which uh, an enormous number of New Yorkers uh, depend on for, for their lives. And unfortunately, while we stopped some of the, some of the things he was trying to do uh, to home care, um, we could not uh, pull together the resources to, uh, to buy back in, in, in our budget terminology, to buy back some of the really drastic cuts uh, that he was insisting on. There are a lot of people who today would be entitled to home care under Medicaid, get the care that they need, be able to stay in their homes, uh, and they're just not going to be able to get that care uh, in the future. And either they will get sicker and die, or they will force out of their homes into nursing homes, or a family member, and in our culture, it's usually uh, a woman family member uh, will will give up uh, a large part of her career or a large part of her life uh, to care for a, a family member who is either uh, frail and elderly or a person with disabilities uh, to try to provide care for them uh, uh, on their own uh, without professional help. It's going to be very nasty. Uh, and we're going to try in the next uh, few weeks and, and, and again when whenever we reconvene 
uh, to try to undo some of those cuts. Uh, hopefully people will see what was done and will uh, will speak up and help us fight back. Uh, so that's, uh, I, I hate to be uh, uh, kind of a Debbie Downer, but uh, there was a, a lot of bad stuff done in this year's budget. Vicki, you're muted. Sorry, thank you, Richard. Be well, and um, I'm now calling on Congresswoman Maloney. She was I, actually almost the first person to come on for the evening. So welcome, Carolyn. I'm so excited to, to be, I wish I was there in person and that we were all there together, uh, but I'm so excited to be able to speak to you, Vicki, and, and to all your board members and to my colleagues in government. Uh, First, I want to wish everybody a happy Passover, a happy Easter, and thank you for your commitment to our community by serving on the community board. It's so very, very important. I, I want to talk about the congressional efforts uh, of our Congress, our government, to help our cities and states across the country. And we know that our city and state is the hardest hit in the United States, and the United States is now the hardest hit of any country in the world. We passed an unprecedented bill. 2.2 trillion, as in T, the largest ever. It was not perfect, but it was a very needed disaster relief. Uh, and Democrats worked very hard to have this money go directly to people and our hospitals and our mass transit and other things, but going directly to people. It did have money for our governor and our mayor, but it had a very important uh, uh, provision in it that uh, uh, which provided like a major reform to our unemployment uh, and expansion of the unemployment insurance program. Uh, and and uh, we, we need unemployment insurance to cover m many more Americans and provide more generous benefits during this crisis, including, and, and for the top, first time, we included Americans who have non-traditional employment. The extended unemployment program uh, increases the maximum unemployment benefit by 600 per week and ensures that laid off workers on average will receive their full pay for four months. It ensures that all workers are protected whether they work for business, small, medium, large, and the, for the first time we covered self-employed workers, and I'd say the gig economy, which is a lot of people in our district who work in music or work in the arts, they don't really work for anyone, but they work for themselves and they work for art. So that uh, is a very important part uh, that we put in. A very major part was billions of dollars for our health care system for needed treatment during this uh, crisis. And it had a formula that reimburses that our hospitals will like a lot because it reimburses on the basis of how many uh, people you treat with the corona virus. And uh, we all know that we cannot heal our economy until we turn around the tide against this COVID-19 pandemic. So it's important that we stop it right now. And it in injected billions into our hospitals and health care system and billions into personal protective equipment for health care workers, testing supplies, increased workforce, training, new construction, uh, and all of that, and more money for our strategic national stockpile. Very importantly, Vicki, I have been told by many hospitals that now their biggest challenge is the fact that they don't have the workers. Now, we've been sending in federal people to back them up, but I introduced an important bill today to eliminate the student debt for frontline health care workers. We're in such dire straits that they are pushing uh, health care workers, our doctors usually have to go four years to medical school and then their specialties and their internships, but it now they're coming out of school after three years and this will reduce their debt or re remove the debt uh, for them. It's enough that they're coming in to save people's lives, they shouldn't be burdened with this uh, debt. 
the IRS has already started sending out checks to everybody, and it's uh, on a sliding scale formula. I can express it more if anybody has a question on it. But you should start receiving 1,200 individual 2,000 joint. And very importantly, my favorite program is the Paycheck Protection Program for Small Businesses. And it covers, again, the gig workers, self-employed, uh, sole proprietors. Now, they call it a loan program. But for businesses with less than 500 employees, it's really a grant. They give you a loan for two months. And if you funnel that money in to cover your employees, who may not be working but need to be there to come back when you open up again, 75% uh, for payroll, 25% uh, for uh, other costs such as rent, you get a 100% loan forgiveness. Uh, this, they have been mobbed with the amount of people coming in to the district. I get more complaints on people not being able to get a loan, the lines being too long, many people are moving to take advantage of it. And it has a, another very important one is the I, EIDL loan, it's the Economic Injury Disaster Loans. That can go up to two million and it uh, can be paid out over 30 years with no interest uh, for up to four years, and it gives a 10,000 emergency grant to sort of bridge uh, your, your time to get that, that loan. Uh, so we're moving in a lot of ways. Uh, as chair of the Oversight Committee, I pushed for FEMA, that's our disaster relief program, to issue the major disaster declaration for New York. Within six hours, they issued it, we were the first state in the country to get it. I also called for a nationwide moratorium on foreclosures and evictions on federally backed uh, GSC mortgages. The next day the administration granted it. Believe me, we are in a disaster personified and everybody's responding. And just today, or not today, it was really Monday, I led a New York congressional delegation letter calling on NYCHA to more effectively implement COVID-19 outreach cleaning protocols throughout all of our NYCHA developments in our city. And I want to push this. This is very, very important. Everyone, while you're home, I implore you to fill out the census if you haven't already. We're down 10% in our response rate compared to 10 years ago uh, for the east side of Manhattan. And the census affects everything from the amount of federal money going to our schools, hospitals, and subways to the m number of people who represent you. So if you fill out this, you are filling it out for yourself and your own community and your, your support. Very importantly and very briefly, we have to make sure that these trillions of dollars are spent well and we have oversight. We had stringent oversight put in place, uh, an IG to look at it, a, a total a group of uh, pandem pandemic response accountability committee of the inspector generals are there to see that money spent appropriately. The, the, gov the, the president fired this week two IGs. He fired the IG that came forward with a whistleblower complaint, and he fired the IG who was chosen to be the chairman of this new pandemic response accountability committee with widespread support uh, from Congress. And uh, I have filed a complaint and filed two bills Say number one, he's got to put the pandemic uh, response guy back because Congress wanted him and he's qualified. There's no reason to remove him from office and that he can't remove IGs without showing due cause. This is a, a major assault on our democracy and our, our separation of powers, our checks and balances. If he removes all of the IGs, he's removed two of them, he has his eye on eight more that were uh, appointed by President Obama. So we are working, that's what I've been working on today, uh, as pushing back on his effort to basically remove accountability and oversight, looking at waste, fraud, and abuse in this $2.2 trillion that we, uh, we, we, we voted for. Our taxpayers deserve uh, this accountability. It's their dollars. And it's our responsibility to look after it. And as chair of the Oversight Committee, that's what I'm working on. I'd be delighted to answer any questions. And my heart is with you. 
Uh, like you, I, my favorite part of the day is at 7 o'clock when we go out and applaud for our heroes and heroines, uh, and we have to give them all the support they need. In some of my hospitals, they have, out over, they have over 200 people out sick, me health workers out sick. So thank you for your work. You're, you're part of uh, what makes our city great and leads our city and why we're such a great city. You're the community voices, and I always listen to everything you have to say. Thank you for having me on at your meeting. I wish we were there together, uh, but I thank you deeply. And I yield back. Okay, thank you so much, Carolyn, and be well. That was very informative. Uh, next, uh, Senator Liz Kruger. Hi, everybody. Nice being sort of with you in this weird period of history. Um, it is such a tough time, and my heart goes out to any of you who have already lost family and friends. I feel like none of us haven't already experienced that. And yet we get up every morning and we do what we can to be value added during this period and to know that this pandemic will pass sooner than later. Um, like I think all my colleagues in elected office, our staffs are doing unbelievable work from their homes responding to any issues that come to our offices um, by phone, by email, by mail. So please keep contacting us if we can be helpful. Um, we do daily updates on what we have learned and what we think can be um, important in the community. But if you have other things you want to make sure that get out there to people, please just let us know, send an email to us, and we'll make sure it goes into our daily update that continues to go out to, I don't know, 50, 60,000 people every day. Um, Dick described one end of the state budget. The other end of the state budget is the truth is um, we're in a fiscal crisis brought on by the combination of the pandemic and now a world collapse of our economy. So we aren't going to be getting tax revenue. So we're going to be in bigger trouble. Carolyn Maloney just went into detail about some of the tremendous things the feds have done. And I thank her and our entire congressional delegation and our US senators for doing what they have been doing. And I am now begging them publicly for more money. They're the only government that gets to print money in the basement and they need to keep printing it and sending it to the state of New York. Uh, because otherwise the description Dick gave you is just really the beginning of the cuts we'll see, not the end of the cuts we'll see. Um, the, the disturbing cuts he described um, by and large can't go into effect during the pandemic. They're sort of on hold. Um, but again, when the numbers go down, when people go back into more of their normal life, um, but perhaps not back to employment and not back to their ability to pay their taxes, uh, the revenue coffers of the state will continue to be in serious trouble. Again, unless the federal government continues to send us additional money to meet our basic cost of functioning. Um, the MTA is plummeting into a um, deep, deep well of no money for obvious reasons, because nobody's riding it. Um, and I'm not suggesting you do so at this moment in history, but just know that that is also hanging out there over our heads. And we're going to have to confront that as well. I will tell you, if you want a little good reading, go into the, or cheerful, better reading, go into the budget's environmental sections, because we did hold strong on our environmental policies and our hopes and aspirations for the future. And really, thank you all of Community Board 5 for continuing um, to go above and beyond as private citizens on behalf of your community and the city. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you, Liz. And um, uh, I think our environment's the only thing that's doing well in all of this. Um, it's got a little bit of a reprieve. A little bit, you're right. If, if we can look at anything positive. Uh, but thank you again and do be well. Um, I'm calling on um, our borough president, Gail Brewer. And also um, wishing everybody well. I remember way back when, when Community Board 5 was so helpful 
in participating in saving the garment center in Manhattan. So I want to say I never forgot that meeting. You even held the meeting until I got there so I could scream and yell about saving it. I'll never forget that. But good news is that to the credit of the Economic Development Corporation, some of the manufacturers who testified at your hearing um, today actually took a while, but got some pretty big contracts to do the surgical gowns. So it's all thanks to you that they are sewing away. And there's quite a few of them that got contracts. So we'll be able to have some kind of announcement next week. And I want to make sure that you're part of it. So I just want to tell you that happened. And also there's a group called Adafruit, which is one of the few manufacturers left in Manhattan. And they have a contract for 2000 face shields. Um, and I think I was very uh, responsible for pushing for those. So congratulations to board five. That was a big deal. Um, we have much more work to do in the garment center, but that's for another discussion. Second, also thanks to board five, all of the East Midtown keeps popping up. It's like a doesn't go away. So we all knew that 347 Madison Avenue, the MTA building, Vicky sat through all the meetings, Wally sat through all the meetings, everybody sat through all those meetings, um, would in fact someday become <laughs> eligible for uh, tear down, new building, whatever. So we now know, of course, that Boston Properties bought it, 99 year lease. I'm giving you the short version that you probably already have. But in Albany, I want to thank uh, the individuals there because I think the governor, to his credit, obviously we all wanted the money from Boston Properties to go to the MTA because God knows they need it. But we also wanted the extra money that would go thanks to East Midtown to the MTA. So it happened. It's the last line of the statement about 347, but it says, uniform land use review procedure based on east midtown thank you board five so i just want to let you know the new members may not understand how important that is but you'll share it and that's very much thanks to you so two great things that in retrospect board five did um i just want to mention also to pick up on uh the wonderful uh congressman's discussion about the census you know, Algen Bonillo in our office was in charge of it in 2000 in Manhattan. So he's very up on this issue. And it's interesting. It's mostly Board 8 that's not doing well in terms of numbers. But there's probably quite a few people in Board 6 who are not in the city. And so those numbers are low. Uh, Harlem is, parts of Harlem are low. Number one is Washington Heights. They're 45%. They've always been number one. So... Um, interestingly enough, people, maybe they're away and they don't think they have to fill out the census. They do. So I just want to say extra effort to board six and board eight because your numbers are very low for the reasons that I just outlined. Um, we were happy that I get something called Notify NYC, which is the, uh, you know, you usually get something about a storm or traffic, but we were able to get into that thanks to the City Office of Emergency Management um, a staff member in our office said, what about Notify NYC? So it goes to 860,000 New Yorkers uh, about the census. So we hope that that too, because we're not doing well. The Congresswoman is right. I hate to say that, but we're not doing well in filling out the census compared to where we were before. Yes, we have more time, but we have to do well. In terms of the small business, a um, couple of things. Uh, we managed to get a wonderful person who's a professor at Columbia University called Tim Wu. And if you let us know if it's a small business that's having trouble filling out the very complicated but very needed wonderful work that Carolyn Maloney and others did in terms of the federal CARES application, uh, Professor Wu and the students will help. I cannot tell you how many emails I have gotten on this topic. Oh my goodness. But they're going through them all. So if that's something, particularly if it's five or less employees, but they'll do something small as a business or a nonprofit. And then second, next Monday night, well, it's in our newsletter at Columbia University with the business school, we're doing a YouTube for an hour. We did one on education last week, it was very successful, and we're gonna do it with people who know how to fill out the application and who know what's going on. I wanna thank the bids. We had a, a conference virtually with all the business improvement districts in the borough of Manhattan. They're, they're really phenomenal. The one in your area is phenomenal. They're all phenomenal. And what they were thinking about, which is what we all do, although it sounds strange, is what happens next? And they had such great ideas. Open space will be different. 
restaurants will be different. Um, just, you know, people will be different in general. So how do we help the small businesses come back? And, you know, the folks from the Hospitality Alliance, even before this horrible uh, virus, they had come up with a suggestion about how to help small business in terms of fines and fees being reduced or eliminated, et cetera. I think all of that needs to be on the table. And your board has some phenomenal business people, phenomenal. And so it would really be helpful, even though it seems far away, it's not. How do we really make the opportunity for small business to be real after this horrible, horrible uh, virus? So that's something that I could use some help on. The business improvement districts are thinking about it. They have ideas. And we'll send out a memo to you what they came up with. But I hope that you would also come up with some ideas. So the whole world of small business now and in the future. Um, I also, I think you already know that the, you know, the Euler clock is uh, paused until the pandemic is over. Um, who knows when they'll change it, that again, but that's what's going on. I also want to thank you for using the Zoom license. I think you know that every single community board in Manhattan is uh, virtually communicating and Brooklyn got upset. I was so happy. <laughs> Brooklyn was jealous. I was delighted. So they're now trying to figure out what the hell to do. Good. Yay, Manhattan. Um, and we're also, um, you know, the issue of what's essential and not is very challenging. I know the governor's office is in charge of figuring that out. Um, but we did push uh, to make sure that the uh, dry cleaners, because they're part of the laundromat world. And I don't know about you, but I'm getting tons of calls that people can't find the laundromat, which is a real challenge when there's not one in your building or in your apartment. And also bike shops. So they're essential businesses for the time being. I want to thank Fresh Direct, not necessarily in your area. And I know that you have uh, NYCHA housing, but Fresh Direct has been going to all the NYCHAs. They are starting from the top of Manhattan to the bottom. They don't go to every one because it's only five days a week. But every day for the last three weeks and until the pandemic is over, they will go like to starting up at uh, Inwood, Dykeman Houses and going all the way down to Valadic. And they have a similar stop every single week. The residents come out, they sort them out and they get them to the right adults and families in that development. It's pretty amazing. And I just want to say thank you to them because, uh, you know, not many organizations would have to do that. And of course, it's all free of charge. Um, I think we all know that the plastic bag legislation is going to be paused for a little while. That's something that I'm sure you're aware of. There won't be any enforcement at this particular time, which I can understand. One last thing is that I looks like I might be getting somewhere between 200 and 3,000 masks tomorrow delivered to my house. And I'm going to focus on the home health aides because I cannot tell you how many calls I've been getting from nursing homes and senior centers when the home health aide has to go to somebody who's come home from the hospital or somebody who is already ill and needs a home health aide. They're not going to go if they don't have, and I don't blame them, the proper uh, PPE. So we've been focused on that. And if you have some in your area that the board office has heard about, please let me know. Um, and I think we're all going to have to work with the wonderful council members you have on the city budget. My email is now swamped as yours will be about the cuts. They're necessary in some cases, but I think your input as to what can be done here or there would be very helpful. So congratulations, and uh, I look forward to continuing to work with you. And thank you very, very much for all of your leadership, past and present. Thank you, Gail. I'm, I hate to admit, but I, was, I not only remember the whole thing with Garment Center, but I was on the board at the time. Seems yeah. like a lifetime ago. That's right. Yeah, thank you so much and be well. You too. Okay, uh, next I think we have a councilwoman, Carlina Rivera. Hi, Carlina. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Thank you so much for having me. I will be brief. I know you specifically asked us to do that and my colleagues have done such a great job in covering a lot of the work that we're trying to do together. Uh, as Gail and, and Keith mentioned, um, very, very thankful to them for some of the food access efforts that we have all kind of joined together. Uh, my office has been coordinating probably hundreds of volunteers to do some of these food drops, thanks to uh, Gail's uh, relationship with Fresh Direct and some of our public housing developments. 
And then along with Bean Living uh, in some of the other areas in Kipps Bay, Food Access, if you know anyone who is food insecure, please have them contact our office and we will work on serving them, even if it's with a home delivery. It's just such an important issue right now. Um, the small business work that we're also doing, you've seen some town halls with some of our merchant associations with the Small Business Administration, as well as Small Business Services. As you may or may not know, the Small Business Service uh, Program, that one actually closed. And so they're figuring out um, how to really distribute this money. As for the federal program, there are some restrictions um, there are, as well as unemployment insurance benefits, many of our undocumented New Yorkers are not covered. And so I know we have uh, some of our uh, Congress members working to really include people who do not necessarily have a social security number to receive benefits who do pay taxes. So I'll save my last minute on hospitals. I am the chair of the committee on hospitals in the city council. Um, as you know, we are the epicenter of coronavirus. We are seeing our hospitals at, at capacity 90, 95% full in terms of our hospital beds, um, our ICU beds. Some of our hospitals are actually acting as giant ICUs. These are Elmhurst Hospital, Queens Hospital, Lincoln Hospital, Woodhull, and even smaller ones that are not part of the larger networks, but that are still private hospitals like Jamaica. So some of them are, are having some issues of functioning and unfortunately, we haven't really figured out how to work as one system. You've probably heard sometime last week, the governor mentioned that public and private hospitals would start working as one system. Um, it's more theory than, than practice right now. And so there are many, many logistics still being figured out, including patient transfers, including uh, supply sharing logistics. So while we might hear some good news about reaching this apex sooner than later, there are still many, many challenges within our hospital system. I know that Assembly Member Gottfried would agree with me that I think this has been an excellent case for universal health care and really having one system working together. Um, I'm really trying my best to, in terms of taking constituent cases. We still have hundreds of cases. Again, we're coordinating volunteers. People can actually call seniors and our disabled New Yorkers uh, uh, from home, we're making sure that we get them lists, we get them a script and a list of resources so they could properly refer people and then we follow up. Mm -hmm. So if I know anything about New Yorkers, I know that when times get rough that we do come together and we build a support system. And so I'm trying my best to do that. Uh, I did that right after Hurricane Sandy when I was an organizer at Good Lower East Side. So we do have a coalition of fabulous organizations in CB5 and 6 and throughout the Lower East Side that are really working hand in hand. So I'm very, very proud of, of what we're doing, of all of you. Uh, many of you have reached out to me to help to see what you can do. And of course, we're continuing to have these spaces. It's very hard to be together, but even virtually, I think it's so important. It is so nice to see your faces. Um, I just hope that you're taking care of yourself. Please do. You're very, very important to me. You're very important to the, your community and the city. And if you need anything, you could always email district2 at council.nyc.gov, or you could give me a call. Thank you so much, Carlina, and be well. Thank you. Um, I think I see that we also have Annabelle DeCastro, State Senator. Is um, I don't see it on the screen, but I think I see a hand raised. Yes, is it okay if I speak? Oh, okay. Oh, uh, hi, there you are. <laughs> okay, hi. hi. <laughs> so hi everybody, my name is Annabelle. I'm a new community liaison at Senator Brad Homan's office. Um, my apologies that he couldn't make it tonight um, at, at the last minute. Um, so our office has been busy assisting many constituents um, get through to the Department of Labor to apply for unemployment. Um, but today we're happy to share that many of the concerns about the application process have been uh, addressed and there's a new system. Um, and starting today, uh, the Department of Labor has switched over to a new system to process unemployment insurance applications. So once you submit your online application, a representative from the Department of Labor will give you a call back in 70, uh, within 72 hours. Um, so if you submitted an application before April 9th, and we're instructed to call uh, the Department of Labor, you don't need to do so anymore. Um, you should uh, receive a call by Monday, April 13th. 
Um, and if not, you can reach out to our office um, uh, to receive further assistance. Um, I want to also mention that the Senator has introduced a uh, new legislation called the New York State uh, Tenant Safe Harbor Act with uh, Assembly Member Dinowitz and Senator Kruger. Um, it will prevent landlords from ever seeking possessory judgment, also known as evictions, for unpaid rent that accrues between the beginning of the COVID-19 state disaster emergency through a six month period following the end of the emergency, whenever that is. Um, so landlords would continue to be able to seek money judgments for unpaid rent that accrues during that time, but tenants would have housing stability with no threat of eviction for non-payment in the meantime. Um, I also wanna mention that the mm -hmm. Senator introduced legislation to preemptively authorize pharmacists and certified nurse practitioners to administer COVID-19 vaccines as soon as one is approved for use by the FDA. And finally, I want to mention that the Senator introduced legislation to create a $1,000 tax credit for New Yorkers who have recovered from COVID-19 and donated their blood plasma, either for medical research or for the treatment of patients currently suffering from COVID-19. Um, and yeah, um, it's good to see everybody. Um, if there's anything our office can assist you with, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Okay. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. Is there anyone else here who is an elected, not the representatives, but an elected? Okay, we now move Lori, into- Lori, Lori. Um, no, representatives, uh, yeah. we're moving into, I wanted to know if any of our electeds themselves were here. That was what that passed was um, taking into account. So at this point then, we will move into the representatives of electeds who will be permitted to speak for two minutes. Make sure you click the raised hand and I'll take you in the order in which you click, so click away. I will start, <clears throat> excuse me, I will start with Lori because I know you don't have that ability. Is that correct, Lori? That's correct. Can you hear me? Yes, can. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so very quickly, uh, I just want to say that our, our office is open for business. Um, we've been working remotely like everyone else for the last few weeks, but we have hundreds of cases. Um, as you can imagine, lots of unemployment issues and lots of small business issues, but we've been working through them. We've also um, converted our monthly newsletter to a weekly newsletter. Um, and uh, we are trying to start a housing clinic. Usually we do one once a month. Um, so we're calling through our attorneys to see if uh, we can set that up once a month now uh, remotely. Um, we've also been calling through all of our seniors and some of the people we know are vulnerable right now, especially with food insecurity. Um, and that's been an ongoing process. Um, and that's, that's pretty much what I wanted to share, only that, you know, if you have any issues, you have any constituents, uh, please send them our way. We are more than happy to work with them. Okay, thank you, Lori, and be thank well. You. Okay, I don't see any hands raised. Do we have other representatives? Uh, can you click the button, hand raise? I don't see the button, but... That's okay, now I can see because it, it uh, outlined you. That's Lucas, right? Yes. From hi, everybody. Spring, uh, Scott Stringer's office. Yes. Hi. Okay. Uh, I'm Luke Wolf. I'm from City Controller Scott Stringer's office. Um, first, I want to start, start by thanking uh, Vicki and Wally and everyone else who had a hand in putting this together. It's great to see all, um, all of you here and well right now. I just want to speak for a moment about some of the stuff that our office has been doing um, in the face of this crisis. We have all I've uh, been working around the clock. Our pension teams are meeting constantly to assess changes in the markets, make sure our retirees still keep getting their checks on time. Our budget teams are assessing the impact of every, all the economic change on the city budget. Um, our policy team put out a comprehensive demographic profile of all of the frontline workers to see who are um, the people who work in healthcare and public transit and at the grocery stores and all the other people who are still um, protecting our city, keeping our city safe, keeping our city well fed. Um, and what we found was that those people are overwhelmingly um, people of color. Um, the majority of them are women. We have a higher number of undocumented people than the city average who are working in those roles. And we call for a lot of steps to make sure those are protected, those workers. So we want them to have access to healthcare and childcare, um, have free city bikes so they're able to get safely and quickly 
um, and efficiently to work and a number of other steps to make sure that our frontline workers are protected. Uh, we also released a policy package specifically to protect um, domestic violence survivors. Right now we have seen a heightened level of domestic violence in the city around the country and around the world. So there's a number of steps we want our state to take to make sure those are, people are protected. And we call for a number of steps um, in terms of hotlines that are available, supports available, and in the court system to make sure that our survivors are still protected. Something that we came out with yesterday was we released our comprehensive uh, COVID resource guide. I just dropped the link in the chat if you would like to give it a look. This information, whether you are a homeowner or tenant, a uh, small business, nonprofit, a freelancer. So really, no matter who you are, um, there are resources available for you in the guide, and we will continue to keep it updated regularly. Um, so that is just a brief overview of some of the stuff we have been working on. Uh, our office is open and uh, hard at work. So please, if there's anything we could ever do to help out CB5 or any of your neighbors and the rest of the community, we are here. So okay. thank you. Thank you, Lucas, and be well. Uh, is there anyone else who is representing an elected? Although we had almost all our electeds here tonight. I think that does it. I'm, I'm here, Brad. Oh, sorry. Brad, okay. Yes. Welcome. Uh, quickly, yeah. Thank you so much, Vicki. I just wanted to say hello. I, I know Senator Kruger was here. Um, the one thing I would say is that, you know, we're trying to be resources to the community. Uh, please call our office. You know, the thing, Vicki, that we've gotten most calls and emails about, which is really telling about the impact of this crisis, is unemployment insurance. And, uh, you know, it, uh, 20 million, uh, they estimate Americans will have filed for unemployment insurance by the end of this month. So we're trying to help. Um, uh, with, with, with Annabelle, who's from my team on the line, um, to help folks uh, navigate themselves through the state unemployment insurance portal, which is a little complicated. It's gone offline for several hours tonight. It should be back on by 7 p.m. with a new and improved website uh, where if someone is unemployed uh, and is seeking insurance, they can call in uh, and then uh, rather they can, they can go online enter their phone number and they should get a call within uh, 24 hours from uh, a, a, a specialist. So that's what they're telling us is, is the new system, which hopefully will work better than the old one, which has been wildly um, overloaded with, with, uh, with applications. <laughs> Secondly, Vicki, I just wanted to say that uh, Senator Kruger and I introduced a bill uh, this week, which would, um, which we're calling the Tenant Safe Harbor uh, Protection Act, uh, allow New York State tenants six months after the COVID declaration of emergency ends to then um, start paying their rent and prevent landlords from evicting them. It's uh, currently the, the, the governor's um, moratorium on evictions only runs through through June 18th, which means that on June 19th, uh, landlords could start filing for physical evictions of tenants. And we know that by that date, um, most tenants will not have you know, sought the employment if they have lost their jobs, gotten healthy, and be ready to start paying rent. So we're looking for a six month safe harbor provision after the uh, COVID-19 crisis has passed uh, in order to protect tenants and stop them from physical eviction, keep them in their homes. So those are two things that we're working on right now. In addition to all the resources that we're offering, you know, volunteer opportunities, um, trying to make sure that we go back to Albany um, in the uh, next week after our session ends, um, after we pass the, the, the budget. And just a word on the budget, it was mostly, I'm sure Senator Kruger might've spoken about it, it was a bad news budget in so many ways, uh, $177 billion, but you know, we did the best we could uh, with, with Senator Kruger leading the way as the finance chairperson to, to push back on cuts, cuts to things like our education, uh, uh, our, our, our public schools and our, and our hospitals. Um, in our Senate district alone, there were $60 million worth of uh, cuts uh, according to the uh, governor's budget, but we saved $200 million of those. And when it comes to our public schools, we um, kept the level of funding 
as the previous year. So uh, the foundation aid will be the same as last year. It's not a big win, but it's something. Uh, and then finally, we extended a $3 billion lifeline to uh, the MTA to keep the subways running. So all in all, not a great budget situation for a whole host of reasons, including that $20 you know, million dollar unemployment figure, uh, 20 million American uh, unemployment figure, but um, we're doing the best we can. That's great. Thank you, Brad. It was so nice to see you as well as Likewise. hear what you have to say. So be well. Thank you. And thank you. Okay, now we will move into our public session where the public will be allowed to speak for two minutes on subjects that they feel are important for our board to hear. Um, in so doing, we move the public from, uh, I believe, from attendees into, is it panelists? So that we can see who's speaking. I mean, the whole idea of this is to have it as close to a regular meeting as possible where we are seeing each other. It's not like a telephone conference call, hopefully. So Luke, you move everybody in and then I would ask everyone to please click raise your hand and I will call on you in the order in which those clicks come in. Vicki, we wanna um, do everyone or just individually the people who only wanna talk? I guess you could do individually if it works that way. But that then they can click from where they are. They don't have to be panelists to click. Is that correct? Um, once they're panelists. Um, I won't know. How will I know who to pull in? That's why I'm saying make them all panelists and they'll raise their hands unless they can raise their hands as attendees. They can raise their hands as attendees. Okay. okay. So then let them raise their hands as attendees and we'll, you'll pull them in one at a time as a panelist. Fine. As okay. you call them. Okay, if everyone could go ahead and click. Okay, Renee, you would like to be in the public this evening? Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> Oh, it came through as, hold on one second. It came through as Renee Kinsella. That's why I was confused. Oh. It's Renee Confaro. Hello, <laughs> hello. Hi. Um, seven yeah. o'clock, Renee, at seven o'clock, we want to take a moment. Remember that. Yeah. And if you're not finished, then we'll go ahead with you when we finish. Um, mine's really easy because I'm actually going to, I'll drop uh, the link in the chat for everybody, but um, I started a couple of relief efforts. Um, so a couple of things, you know, I have, uh, you know, I was uh, trying to help out friends and small businesses in, in the garment district and, and uh, freelancers around the city um, and hired a bunch of people to make masks and hospital gowns. Uh, most of those have already been distributed to hospitals in need in the city, but I have about 50 or so masks that um, are either uh, too thin or are two pieces. So there's a filter and then like the top piece that I can't see that the hospitals won't take. So uh, I'm reserving them for people who are immunocompromised like myself uh, or in desperate need of a mask or PPE. So if anyone really needs one, um, you know, or hand sanitizer, I have both of those things. I'm waiting for some supplies from the, um, USPS to come here because I came to my house with my my immune problems. So when I get mailers in, I can mail out um, you know supplies to any community board members who are in desperate need. But uh, real quick, so then my second thing is Eats for EMTs. Um, it's a GoFundMe that I started on Monday. We're already up to ten thousand dollars, which is amazing. Uh, I'll drop the link in here. But basically, the idea is that. Uh, you know, I started to front some, some money, but now we're getting some community in to buy lunches from local restaurants um, who can uh, be up to task to uh, feed the 4,000 EM, uh, FDNY EMS workers throughout the city. Um, and uh, Madison Square Park's very own born and bred Shake Shack was the first people to come to me to help. So they'll be our first people. We're going to be in the Bronx this weekend. Well, not, I'm not physically, but if anyone wants to help, I have a GoFundMe and I'll drop that in here too. 
That's it. Okay. We're almost, we're almost seven. <laughs> yes, that's perfect. That's perfect. Thanks, Renee. And please, please, please stay healthy and well. Oh, just going to stay inside. <laughs> right. Vicki? Yes. Uh, there are some people from the public who've been uh, moved to panelists but can't find the hand raise function. Maybe, maybe what we can do is call on them um, after we get through the people who are already in the panelist section, um, call on them and then transfer them over. Okay. <clears throat> Let's do the hand clap now. I think it's seven o'clock, isn't it? Yes, just seven now. Okay. All right, is everyone, has everyone been unmuted? Luke? All right. Okay, applause. Yay. Hello. <laughs> hey. Okay. Super. My screen, if that could come back on. Can you see it? Can you can you see the yeah, timer? Yeah, we can we can see the timer. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Now I need to see the um, the list of uh, names and people who would like to speak, which I do not have. If Vicky, if you look at the panelist uh, section in the participants, that has disappeared from my screen. Okay, so you'll find that at the bottom of the screen. If you navigate your cursor towards the bottom. Okay. Click on participants. Okay. All right, so we will hear first from Ryan Smith, who will be um, now made a panelist, is that correct? Yep. And uh, two, once Ryan starts, the two minute timer will start as well. So Ryan. All right, well, thank you very much, Vicki, for letting me speak tonight. Thank you for everyone for uh, participating in this great uh, virtual meeting and making sure business gets done. Um, I live on the Upper East Side, actually, uh, outside of CB5, but I've been using um, Sixth Avenue to connect um, up to my home through Central Park uh, on a bike, as well as by walking um, from anything I have to do in Midtown for many years. Um, and I just want to say thank you for the years of advocacy that this board has put in trying to get the Department of Transportation to finish the 6th Avenue bike lane and the safety improvements at the intersections on the portion of 6th Avenue that hasn't been done yet between Herald Square and Central Park. Um, and thank you for uh, ensuring that the proposal that the DOT finally has um, was heard by the Transportation Committee by video earlier this month um, in light of the current situation. Um, it's obviously more important than ever that folks have an ability to, to move around safely and, and healthfully, um, and that is a big part of it. So I just want to say thank you to the board and certainly to uh, uh, voice my support for this getting done as quickly as possible. And um, I hope that the full board will support the committee's unanimous uh, resolution tonight to finally um, have Sixth Avenue um, fixed once and for all. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. That was short and sweet and uh, loaded with thank yous, which we like. Be well. Okay, the next uh, person up will be David Warren. As soon as David speaks, the timer will start. And Luke is making him a panelist. He is a panelist. Okay. David? Good evening, everyone. Thank you again for allowing me to speak. Um, I spoke at the committee meeting, thanked the committee for their unanimous vote on uh, 6th Avenue. I am a um, board member of community, I serve on community board four, but I don't represent them. 
So I just wanted to let you know, I, I understand the effort and the time that you all put in. So I do it on community board four. Uh, but once again, I'm, it, it, I'm, I'm in support of, of a hopefully a unanimous vote again to extend Sixth Avenue as a cyclist uh, when I'm riding up there, which is often, it stops at 35th Street, the protected bike lane. It's sort of like um, if you're a pedestrian and the sidewalk disappears and it turns into a dirt road, that would be the best analogy. So once again, I'm hoping that you'll uh, support this unanimously and thank you all for your time and effort. It is appreciated. Thank you, David, be well. Uh, looks like Matthew Hartman. Did Matt want to speak in the public session? I just wanted to share thank uh, I just wanted to share two quick resources that uh, okay. from I'm Matt Hartman from, from the CB5 board. I wanted to share two quick resources. Uh, one is from the tech community who put together uh, a way to support local businesses, and there's a number of uh, a number of ways to do this. So I'm dropping a link in here for HelpMainStreet.com, which is a way to buy gift cards to the restaurants that are closed. Uh, some of you know I also work at uh, a restaurant that Gold's nearby, and so this is to help a lot of the people who are workers at the restaurants, help people uh, who are who are currently not able to go in. Uh, and then the second link I wanted to share was for anybody who has uh, is a a a 1099 worker, um, or an actor, or a, uh, uh, a waiter. There's a really good resource put together of all of the different places that provide funding. Uh, in addition to the government, uh, in the government funding, if for those people who are working, it's also serves as a pretty good list of places to donate. So I've shared those two in the uh, in the chat here, and thanks for letting me speak. Okay, thank you, Matt. Uh, next up will be Chelsea Yamada. Hi, Vicky. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, this is Chelsea from Transportation Alternatives, typically more present in Manhattan. And unfortunately, I haven't really been uh, in the borough as much as I want to. Um, but I'm really excited to be here and thankful again for uh, Community Board of Fives gracious long meeting airing uh, from the Transportation Committee regarding the Sixth Avenue protected bike lane and pedestrian safety improvements and the bus lane. Um, in this era of open, increasingly open streets, um, instances of speeding have been dramatically on the rise, um, looking to Community Board 5 to increase uh, or to continue to cite if there are increases in traffic speeds. Um, Transportation Alternatives has been trying to continue um, speed safety camera advocacy, et cetera. But just in terms of the uh, open streets and uh, Sixth Avenue redesign, we've seen a lot of reason to believe that in Midtown, you know, density is not really what it's used used to being right now, but um, continuing the call for increasingly wider sidewalks. Um, some of the things that really we spent so much time in the Transportation Committee, um, community members were heard on so many levels, and I know EJ was um, not able to make that meeting, but Sam had, had a great airing of public comment and feedback, but what I didn't see was uh, CB5's ability to maybe strengthen the resolution to continue to call for pedestrian advocacy, especially when, you know, if people are, again, walking around on midtown streets uh, and sidewalks, more importantly, um, you know, we're, we're not going to see the same uh, pedestrian safety advocacy that we really need. So just going forward, you know, um, we look to CB5 and these moments community process um, to see the highlight um, okay. where we can Thank you where very we much. can improve uh, pedestrian safety. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you so much. And okay, thank you. Be well. Uh, I don't see any other hands up. Do you, Luke? Uh, yes, there were a couple people. Um, Sani Mackey? I'm not seeing them. I don't know why. It's they raised their hands as attendees, but are not able to find it. But there's oh, this, these are the right. ones that couldn't find the, okay. Right, so so Sandy, it's Sandy yeah. Mackey, okay. Right, right. It's Sandy, thank you for letting me speak. Oh, sorry, um, Sandy, yes. Okay, my name is Sandy Mackey. Um, I'm here on behalf of the 40 residential unit of Gilsey House who signed a petition in support of the application before you. 
and a 20 plus residence of Gilsey House have attended the CB5 Land Use Committee last month. Gilsey House is 150 years old. It became a residential co-op pursuant to 1977 zoning variants and was designated as the New York City landmark in 1979. Many of the Gilsey House residents have been in the building since that time and are now living on fixed income. Proud of our landmark home and want to be good stewards. Our building is urgently in need of the local law 11 repair and restoration, which our architects estimate will cost in excess of four and a half million dollars. The BSA application before the board tonight, if approved, allow the transfer of 30,570 square feet of air rights from our building to the only feasible site on the block and will give us the resources for the critically needed repairs and renovation to the landmark facade. As a residential co-op, we are not eligible for federal or state historic preservation credits. Grants sufficient to fund the work are simply not available. The transferred air rights represent a two-story increase to a 41-story office building, which is currently under construction at 9 East 29th Street and is as of right. It can and will be constructed with or without our development rights. The middle of our application will not stop the office building but it will hurt the landmark and its residents. Over the past 10 years, this board approved two similar applications for this relief. We hope you will reconsider the committee's vote and vote in favor of our application. Without the proceeds for this sale, our residents face a four and a half million dollar assessment, a burden that is simply unfathomable at this time to all of them and could force some to leave their homes. As your neighbors, part of your community, your families, we thank you for the opportunity to be heard. Thank you. Okay, thank you and be well. Thank you. Um, do we have anyone else who couldn't uh, raise their hand? Yes, there is uh, Valerie Campbell. Okay. Good evening, I'm Valerie Campbell. I'm a partner at Kramer Levin and I'm here representing Gilsey House and the developer of the new building at 7 West 29th Street. The Gilsey House application requests an amendment of its 1977 use variance in order to allow it to transfer its unused development rights. This application is called a Bella Vista application after a Court of Appeals decision, which requires further BSA review for such transfers. At the outset, I would like to clarify the record regarding the board's decision in prior Bella Vista cases. A statement was made at the Land Use Committee that the community board had never approved such an application. Our review of the board's three resolutions on Bella Vista applications indicates to the contrary, two have recommended approval and only one resolution recommended this approval. <clears throat> Bella Vista stands for the proposition that the recipient of a use variant should not in effect double dip by selling development rights to an adjacent property. However, Bella Vista did not enact an absolute prohibition against such transfers. They are allowed when the BSA finds there's no identity of interest between the owner of the variant slot and the transfer site where a substantial amount of time has elapsed between the grant of the variance and the transfer, and where the reason that the BSA did not consider the value of the development rights in the original variance was because these rights had no value. This board considered these factors in its recent 2018 approval for the 35 West 23 3rd Street Bella Vista application, and the facts there are directly comparable. We respectfully submit that the Gilsey House application meets the standards set forth in Bella Vista for such transfers and the board should approve it. We note that a denial will not appreciably reduce the height of the new building receiving the rights, but will impair the Gilsey House's ability to maintain and repair its landmark building. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valerie, and be well. Okay, the next, and I think maybe the last, is Andrew Rosenthal. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, perfect. Um, I'm also um, logging in today to express my support for the 6th Avenue bike lane. New York City had an epidemic before COVID-19 arrived. Uh, we had an epidemic of traffic violence and traffic deaths. Uh, between 200 and 250 people a year are killed on the streets of New York. And I think that uh, this bike lane will save some of them and it will also save pedestrians. Uh, I've worked in New York City for 35 years. 33 of those years was in CB5 at 1221 and 1251 Avenue Americas, among other places in the district. So I'm very familiar with 6th Avenue. I think this would be a real lifesaver. 
I would also ask the committee to petition um, or the council to petition the DOT to remove the pedestrian barriers which are scattered throughout your district. Um, these don't enhance safety and they definitely uh, discourage people from walking, which we all need to do today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Be well. Is there anyone else from the public who would like to speak at tonight's public session? I don't see any, do you, Luke? No, I don't. Okay. All right. That means that the board will now move into our business session. Um, and here we all are again on, on screen. Um, we start now with the ratification of action and the minutes of February 2020 meeting. So may I have a motion and a second? A motion? I move. motion to approve. Okay. And a second. Seconded. 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 Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> since our March full board meeting was canceled, literally at the last minute, in order to meet deadlines, our action items were approved by the executive committee and then were sent to the appropriate agencies. According to our procedure, the full board must ratify the action items and the minutes of the previous meeting, both of which all of you have received and received those in your packets prior to last month's canceled board meeting. We do this ratification by way of the first vote of the evening. And so I now call upon Greg Slutskin, secretary of the board to call the roll for ratification of the action items of March and the minutes of the February full board meeting. Craig. Okay. Akalis. Yes. Athenel. Yes. Eichmann. Yes. Chow. Chu. Yes. Clark. Yes. Dale. Yes. Dosen. Yes. Ford. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Rachel. Yes. Greeley. <laughs> Greeley. Yes. Haas. Yes. Harris. Yes. Hartman. Yes. Higher. Yes. Isaacs. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Payback. Yes. Kalafarski. Yes. Kinsella. Yes. Logasico. Yes. Levy. Yes. Lopez. Yes. Lusick. Yes. Mafia. Yes. McCall. Yes. Meyerson. Yes. Miller. Yes. Raybar. Yes. Shapiro. Yes. Slutskin, yes. Smith. Yes. Spandorf. Yes. Spence. Yes. Shinko. Shinko. Murdy. Yes. Yang. Yes. Is there anybody that I did not call or did not uh, vote? Uh, Simon, did you vote? I couldn't hear you. Okay, that's fine. I see, I see your <clears throat> motion passes. Okay, thank you very much. Passes unanimously. That moves us on to our committee report, starting with Landmarks. Layla. Unmute. All right. Um, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, we had a... Uh, interesting and uh, pretty lengthy uh, uh, committee meeting uh, last week. Uh, we had uh, three applications. Uh, the first one is an application for uh, Rockefeller Center. Uh, as you know and as you recall, um, Rockefeller Center is uh, undergoing a big uh, update and upgrade of uh, and you know general maintenance of uh, of the center and uh, they've been uh, in front of the committee already uh, four times um, and uh, this is the uh, came to us at least that's what they were presented to us and this time they presented a uh, a complete overall of their lighting scheme uh, the goal of uh, the work that they're proposing is really to highlight and enhance the artwork uh, of uh, of the center that they're treating as a uh, you know like um, city 
scale uh, museum. Uh, the artwork uh, you're very familiar with is absolutely exquisite by uh, well-noted artists. And um, the, uh, there is existing lighting, but it is outdated and uh, really in need of, uh, of improvement. So they are proposing uh, something that is, uh, you know, mostly using LED light. Um, the, uh, the, the technology is uh, very precise, uh, very small light fixtures. Uh, everything is entirely invisible. They were very clever in hiding the, uh, the, the fixtures into a uh, flagpole or uh, concealed, uh, you know, within the uh, outline, uh, very elegant, and the effect was, uh, we were just blown away. It's absolutely spectacular. Uh, it's mesmerizing. It's it's a great improvement. Uh, it's going to be absolutely beautiful. And uh, the committee voted uh, unanimously and wholeheartedly to uh, to approve the, uh, the proposal. Okay. If anyone has a conflict with this application, would you kindly click your raise hand button now? And if I don't see anything, looks like no. And, and if, if that is okay, Vicky, I would like to bundle the okay. other. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Okay, uh, are there any questions to this resolution? Click your raise hand. Are there any questions? Click your raised hand. Seeing none, we will move on to the next landmark resolution. Okay, so the next application was uh, very simple. Um, the address is uh, 1162 Broadway. This is in the Madison Square North Historic District. This is an application that actually came to us in 2016. Uh, back th and it is a proposal for a new hotel. Uh, the uh, so it's it's on a vacant uh, site. Well, at the time they came by by a taxpayer building, non contributing. Uh, the permit has been obtained to demolish the uh, the existing uh, structure. Um, in the course of the developer working on the proposal, uh, they have decided to uh, shift gears and uh, they're no longer interested in building a hotel, but they now want to build a commercial office building. Uh, because the zoning for a commercial building is slightly different from the zoning for a hotel, the bulk and the massing distribution has changed. As a result, the design has changed. For those minor changes, uh, the applicant had to come back to us. Overall, the building, I would say, is the same. Uh, it is uh, two feet small, shorter. Uh, we retains the same uh, articulation, the same materials. If anything, the committee felt that the proportions were slightly better because the, uh, the ceiling height is a little higher, the windows are a little taller, and it gives a more elegant uh, aspect to the, uh, to the main facade. Um, we were very pleased, no objection, and we voted to approve. Okay. If anyone has a conflict, kindly click the raise hand now. Seeing none, are there any questions to the resolution? Click the raise hand now. Seeing none, any comments? Click the raised hand now. Okay, next resolution. All right, the uh, last uh, application we had um, last week was uh, is an application for a building at 165th Avenue <laughs> at the corner with um, Fifth Avenue and West 21st Street. Um, the building is, is in the Ladies Mile Historic District. Uh, the applicant, um, which is a, a non-for-profit organization, is um, is the the the, uh, the sole occupant of the uh, the commercial space in uh, in the building, and uh, they are proposing to install a canopy above the uh, the entrance of uh, of the building. 
um, overall, the committee really had issues with uh, the whole notion of a canopy altogether, uh, but also specifically uh, issues about the design. Uh, the committee felt that it was really bulky, heavy, uh, not really uh, matching the other metal elements of the uh, of the building that are very delicate and very elegant. Um, it, you know, protruding too much, uh, obstructing uh, the the, the look and the vista on the facade and uh, voted unanimously to uh, deny the application. Okay, if anyone has any conflict with this resolution, kindly click the raise hand button. Seeing none, are there any questions? Click the button. Okay, and if there are any comments, click the raised hand button. I don't see any, so you have one more, Layla? Nope, that would be oh, that's it. That's it, okay. All right, we are bundling these. We are taking a roll call vote. Craig? Thanks, and just to confirm, I have no uh, conflicts, but if I if, there, if we missed any, please please speak up. Uh, Akalis? Yes. Athenale? Yes. Eichmann? Yes. Chu? Yes. Mark? Yes. Dale. Yes. Dosen. Dosen. Okay. Uh, Ford. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Goshow. Yes. Greeley. Greeley. Yes. Haas. Yes. Harris. Yes. Hartman. Yes. Higher. Yes. Isaacs. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Payback. Yes. Kalaparski. Yes. Kinsella. Yes. Logatico. Logatico. Yes. Uh, Levy. Yes. Lopez. Yes. Uh, Craig, can yeah. you also mark me uh, present not entitled for the Gilsey House vote? Okay. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Lucic. Yes. Mafia. Yes. McCall. Yes. Meyerson. Yes. Miller. Yes. Raybar. Yes. Shapiro. Yes. Slutskin, yes. Smith. Yes. Spandor. Yes. Spence. Yes. Shinko. Shinko. Yes. Okay, I see you marking yes. Birdie. Yes. Yang. Yes. And I'll just try Dosen. Are you Sarah? Are you still on? Uh. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you now. Yes. Okay. Motion pa motion's passed. Okay. We are moving on to transportation. EJ. Okay. Yep, uh, Vicki, we have one resolution this week. I'd like to have it deemed read. So deemed. Um, and I also just want to start by thanking the Transportation Environment Committee um, for what was by all accounts a, and a very smooth and well executed hearing of the issue this month and um, of comments by the public uh, and for helping to just generally prove the concept of a uh, virtual committee meeting. So um, my many thanks to the committee and Vice Chair Sam Levy. Uh, Transportation and Environment uh, received a presentation from the Department of Transportation this month about their plans to install a protected bike lane on 6th Avenue um, between Herald Square and uh, Central Park from 35th Street to 59th Street. This is a stretch that has been conspicuously left out of the protected bike lane, bike lane network so far. And um, this particular stretch of 6th Avenue has had hundreds of injuries and dozens of fatalities over the last five years. Uh, we're also on record as a board calling for a, a protected bike lane on the stretch of 6th Avenue. So um, uh, the Department of Transportation presented their proposal. The proposed configuration satisfied uh, many, if not all, the needs identified by the committee in the past. Um, some uh, uh, pertinent statistics about it. It will remove one traffic lane on this stretch of 6th Avenue, replacing it with a northbound protected bike lane on the west side of the street. 
it'll create a left turn lane at nine intersections uh, where a left turn is currently possible. It'll also create offset crossings at the remaining four uh, intersections where left turns are possible but less common. It'll result in the removal of 43 parking spots along these 24 blocks and these 43 lost parking spots will be almost entirely for the new left turn lanes. And it will uh, update, um, it will make the, uh, the common update of uh, replacing three hour commercial loading zones with one hour loading zones, which has been very standard for these types of reconfigurations and um, insertions of bike lanes. A couple issues that were brought up um, uh, were related to um, the lost the lost parking spots, uh, which again is extremely uh, it's a, it's a common move for this type of reconfiguration. And as usual, the committee brought up um, the issue of enforcement, um, which uh, continues to to be inadequate both um, in terms of uh, moving violations for traffic, but also for um, uh, uh, particular cyclists who who don't follow the rules for um for uh, uh cyclists so um you know those were brought up as concerns cb5 has called for both cycling and pedestrian expansion on the stretch of sixth avenue in the past and so while this proposal certainly addresses um that need for a protected cycling uh uh lane our call for expanded pedestrian access still still stands um uh regardless of uh of this specific proposal um so with all that being taken into account the committee uh recommended approval of this plan the committee asked that um dot also prioritize identifying a complementary southbound protected bike lane in midtown to go with this um with this northbound lane which is uh proposed for sixth avenue um we called on DOT and other appropriate city agencies to uh, continue to identify new ways to advocate for safe cycling behavior outside of enforcement um, and beyond their current um, ambassador uh, efforts. We also asked, um, as we have in the past, that NYPD uh, revamp its current policing of dangerous cycling behavior, which um, which is currently not adequate. So we call on NYPD to, um, to rethink the way that it does enforce um, current rules. And um, finally, we ask the DOT come back to us after this installation and tell us how it's going with data. Okay. Uh, so this was approved unanimously by the committee with a vote of 14 to zero to zero to zero. Okay, it was a very good meeting, very successful with lots of people. <laughs> Uh, okay, if anyone has a conflict with this application, kindly press the raise hand button now. And if we miss anyone, let Craig know when we do the roll call. Does anyone have any questions? Click the raise hand. And if anyone has any comments, uh, Daniel? Do did you raise your hand? Okay, it went off. Uh, any comments? Seeing none, we I will see take- a, Sorry, I see a hand by David Achilles. Oh, there it is, David Achilles, yes. David? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Neighborhood Association, which I represent. We have a membership of over 600 people. The number one concern of our membership in a day-to-day -day quality of life problem is out of control bicyclist. Um, the concern is that uh, there is no enforcement and it's not a police problem. As was stated earlier, it's not a police problem. It's a politician problem. The politicians, not one politician has taken responsibility for enforcing or giving the police the tools and the budget they need to enforce the existing bike laws. There was an article in the New York Times not too long ago about bike safety. They got over 590 replies, the majority of which were concerning out of control bicyclists. A bicycle with an electric motor on it is not an electric bike, it's a motorcycle. These things are capable of doing at least 35 miles an hour 
45 miles an hour if they're going downtown. They're silent, they're dangerous, they're deadly machines. The city has been putting all this money into bike infrastructure and not one penny into bike safety, bike law enforcement. And I would be voting no against this resolution just in the fact that the people who I see at the town hall meetings, at the Midtown North meetings, who bring up the bicycle problem, feel they've got no one speaking for them. The pedestrians have no voice. They don't have a million dollar lobbying corporation like Transportation Alternatives or Lyft speaking on their behalf. So I will be voting no to show my support for the pedestrians that feel they have no voice in the bike law enforcement situation. Thank you. Thank you, David. Any other comments? Uh, Christopher Clark. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes. Um, I was just wanted to respond to the public comment from earlier. I believe it was a representative from Transportation Alternatives um, in relation to this uh, resolution, basically asking us for stronger language, uh, protecting pedestrians. Um, and I, I was going to say that I agree with that. I think that this, since it's such a bike lane centric resolution, this is probably not the appropriate time for us to add in language. Um, about her specific concerns about speeding. Um, but I think that just as a community board, I'm, I'm ex as a member of the community board, I'm excited to find opportunities to put in language like that, affirming our commitment to uh, protecting pedestrians from speeding, both vehicles and, uh, and uh, motorized bikes, as you pointed out. EJ, that would be considered friendly if you want to do that. It's up to you, and then it would be up to the group to accept it. Uh, there's a there's a whereas reiterating um, all, uh, in the resolution already reiterating that community board five is generally supportive of uh, both uh, pr infrastructure protecting both pedestrians and cyclists. Um, so I believe it's represented, but I'd agree with uh, Christopher that um, I, I think going further on on pedestrian safety in the context of a resolution that's specifically about a pedestrian bike lane is is perhaps not uh, the right reso for it. Okay, but at a later time. Yes, absolutely. Okay. All right. Is that okay, Chris? Okay. Um, all right. Do we have, uh, we do, Clayton. Yes, thank you. Uh, I agree that there should be language in the resolution as it is written about enforcement of cycling violations. However, I think the spirit of the resolution is about giving the uh, NYPD the proper tools to do so and carry those out in a way that actually makes sense. Right now, the way that those tickets are given out are kind of like binge based. They stand at the, at the station themselves at the base of the Williamsburg Bridge. Um, when people are coasting off, if they've gained speed coming downhill, there's all kinds of ways that they kind of package the amount of bike violations they give. It's not effective, it's not rational, and they admitted, and we have data now that is publicly available last year, that people riding bicycles receive more moving violations every year than truck drivers in New York City. So uh, with due respect to, to those who want to vote against the resolution about this issue, I think that far and away the strongest thing we can do as a community board is to try to seek a holistic way to make the system better and to try to advocate for ways in which tickets to cyclists can be based in a rational way uh, and certainly a, a truck that is 40 tons uh, should be held to a higher standard than the two percent of our commuters in our city that are cyclists. Okay, so thank I'll you. Uh, David, does that make any difference to you? I mean, we will stand, you know, certainly understand you are voting against this, but would any of this make a difference? Um, actually, no, it doesn't. The, the point being is that we just have not, there's okay. been no mo motion moves, so. Yeah. Okay, got it. <laughs> thank you. Uh, let's see, I don't see any other hands. Have I missed anyone? Okay, seeing none, then we will take this to the last vote of the evening. Um, Greg? Yes, and I believe there were no uh, conflicts. No conflicts. That was, uh, I was wrong. Uh, Yang? Yes. Verdi? Yes. Shinko? Yes. Spence? Spence? Yes. Vandor? Yes. 
Smith. Yes. Slutkin, yes. Shapiro. Yes. Raybar. Yes. Miller. Yes. Meyerson. <laughs> yes. McCall. Yes. Mafia. Yes. Dusik. Yes. Lopez. Yes. Uh, Levy. Yes. Lagasico. Yes. Kinsella. Yes. Kalafarski. Yes. Abash. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Isaacs. Yes. Hire. Yes. Hartman. Yes. Harris. Yes. Haas. Yes. Greeley. Yes. Goshow. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Ford. Yes. Dosen. Yes. Dale. Yes. Clark. Yes. Chu. Yes. Eichmann. Yes. Athenale. Yes. Michaelis. No. Motion passes. Okay, thank you all. Um, before I adjourn, I just want to say I wish everyone a Zisam Pesach and a happy Easter and all the health and well-being for you and your loved ones. Be strong, be safe, be positive, and I'll see you next month or in between for the, commun for the committee meetings, okay? Thanks, everybody. I think this went quite well. Love you all. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. Hmm? Amazing. Bye.